Okay, so um, for the organization, part of this is going to be sort of painfully obvious things that you may or may not have thought of before. Um, we find that, oh, sorry, can you hear me now? No. Any better? Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, now it works. <laughs> Sorry, I find microphones super awkward. Um, so with the organization part, a lot of this is going to be sort of things that are painfully obvious in some ways, yet people still don't do them. So we're just going to try to quantify sort of what are some of the key things to think about. And really what this boils down to is file management at some level. Um, there are certain problems that are very particular to sort of the scientific endeavor. You sort of see lots of files about the same thing, similar structures. So we'll talk about some best practices there, um, go through a very sort of simple exercise to talk about it. But um, hopefully you see some of these best practices that you've used before or other ones that you may not have thought of. So we'll go through those quickly. Um, the key thing to think about, I'm talking about research projects, but this is business projects, any kind of project that you're working on you need to contend with the fact that it's going to get bigger, it's going to scale, um, maybe not all the time, but you really need to at least think a little bit about it at the beginning of, okay, how do I deal with this when I don't just have three files, I've now got 50 or 100 or 1,000, how do I manage this in a reasonable way um, and in an organizational way that I can again hand that directory of everything off to somebody else and it makes sense to them, they're not sort of puzzling out what I meant by valproj3, something like that, so more detailed kind of stuff. Um, like everything else, like software, the files are going to change over time. They're going to have complicated r relationships to each other. So if you're writing an R script, um, one of the things that is a shockingly common problem of issues of running other people's code is things as simple as relative versus absolute file paths. So do you look from where you are currently to a relative path like a couple steps up or are you looking from the root directory on your computer to somewhere else? This is something that breaks all the time. It's usually a fairly simple fix uh, but you need to think about is somebody running it on a system that has exactly the same file system as I do or is it in a different home directory or something like that and it's amazing how many times people get this kind of stuff wrong. So you need to be aware of those kind of dependencies as you write it and organize it in a structured way. Um, there's a really stupid computer science joke that there's only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. And this falls within the naming things kind of stuff. It gets hard to come up with good names that make sense that are both human and computer readable. We'll talk about, again, some best practices there as we go through it. And again, the key point here is to sort of keep entropy and chaos at bay. There's a lot going on. It's going to get bad over time. But how do we sort of get the low-hanging fruit and avoid it as best we can? Um, key principle for file names, again, making that hard problem a little bit easier. The first thing is you want things to be machine readable. So we're big on scripting, we're big on writing things in R, Python, whatever you want. So you want the file names to make sense if you were a computer and you were looking at them. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to maybe want only some subset of the files. So I need to be able to search for them. Having all the files in a particular format or a structured name makes it a lot easier to search for them as I go through and we'll see examples of these as we want. Um, same idea, basically narrowing the file list based on their names in some way. So do I want all my data to be in CSV files or do I want some tab separated? Being consistent makes a big difference as you go through things. Um, and then also the easiest place to put metadata about a file is in its name. That's the easiest way to get it out. You don't have to have any kind of fancy file format or anything else. So simple things like when was the file created? When was the data collected? Put that date in the name of the file. That makes your life a lot easier. Um, human readable, so some of the time you're going to be looking at the files directly yourself um, and particularly if there's hundreds of them, you want a quick way to scan through them and be able to pull them up the ones you want. Um, so what's in the file give you some kind of context, some kind of clue. Again, imagine if you took the entire directory, handed it off to a lab mate and said, figure out what's going on here. You want them to be able to do that without having to ask you lots and lots of questions. Um, semantics, so when do you run it? Again, a very simple thing, often people write a bunch of R scripts to do an analysis and they hand it off. Your file system is going to alphabetize it most of the time. So there'll be the script with an A in it, then a B, so on and so forth. That doesn't give you any indication about what order those scripts should be running. And particularly if they have dependencies of one depends on the output of a previous one, maybe you want to consider numbering your scripts. So script one, two, three, as well as having some other useful name about what it's doing is a good idea because then that automatically says, okay, run one before two, before three, so on and so forth. 
Um, the other thing is, if you're going to number things, you need to be aware of stupid things that operating systems do, incl including default ordering. So if you have a list of files that all start with the numbers 1 to 20, you'll often find that you'll get 1 and then 10 and then 11, then 12, then 13. Um, so just realizing that that happens and then prepending a 0 in front. So 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, that will give you the ordering you expect. Um, but these are the kind of things that you tend to need to work around um, when playing with this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, another thing, so thankfully we don't have to the de have the debate about American versus European dates, so like month, day, year versus day, month, year. The best format to put for a file is think about the order in which you'd look for it, which would be year first, then month, then day. So that's an ISO standard if you cared about that kind of thing. But that's a very good way of sorting it because then you can, you can use your file system's natural sorting to get an order from history latest to current or, sorry, most recent to oldest or oldest to most recent, depending on how you want to look at it and easily sort through it. And again, that same thing then makes it easy to use like the machine readable things of I want to find all the files that occurred from 2012. That's an easy regular expression to write and come up with. So <laughs> I may have made this a little bit more complicated than it needed to be because it didn't have context before so I made up a bunch of stuff. Um, I have a biology undergraduate degree and this is the first time I've been able to use it in quite a while. So. Um, Think about a process where we're basically doing some experiments. And those experiments are each going to individually generate a CSV file. And we then have some kind of inherent hierarchical structure. So what we're doing here is we're using little bits of DNA, little circles called plasmids to transform E. coli so that it'll make something that we want. In this case, this BRAF um, gene. Uh, I looked up what it does and I don't remember anymore. It doesn't really matter. So it's some kind of thing we're testing for and we're basically wanting to see this particular batch of E. coli, we've transformed it in some way. How much is it producing of this particular type of thing? And so what we want to do is sort of record those data in a reasonable way according to sort of the best practices we just talked about. So in terms of the information that we're getting beyond just the raw data that we want to look at is, okay, I'm going to do these assays, I'm going to do these measurements on different days. So that's the first thing that I want to look at. Second, um, these particular assays have to do with BRAF mRNA, so messenger RNA. So what's getting transcribed from the actual DNA. So again, that's something about what's happening. Um, different plasmids for use for transforming the E. coli. So I use different bits of DNA to make it make this particular gene product. So I want to know, maybe my ultimate goal of this experiment is, which of these plasmids is the best one to use if I want the most mRNA produced. So I can have different kinds of plasmids. So in this case, say, plasmid CL56 or say, plasmid CL30, different ones out there. Um, we're then doing readings off of sort of one of these multi-well plates that look something like, oh, no internet. Basically imagine a plastic plate that has little wells in it. The rows are labeled with letters. The columns are labeled with numbers. In the rows, I'm putting in samples from different cultures. So think about a culture as just a big vat of E. coli. I'm taping out three little drops from it, putting it in a well. Um, the columns represent samples, so basically if I take three samples from the same big vat, those are going to go into the columns of that particular well. Um, and then for each of those wells, we're going to do some kind of assay, so some robot's going to come along and sample from the wells, read whatever data, say we're going to take the measurements over an hour, so we get a time series of that. And this is what our data looks like. So we're going to have different files for each um, sample, culture, plasmid, and date. And we want to organize this in some kind of meaningful way. So the point is there's lots and lots of information here that we want to use that's not being encoded in the file, but instead needs to be encoded within the actual name of the file. That's the metadata that we're interested in, and so we want that to be both human readable as well as machine readable so that we can get it out and use it for whatever we're looking at. So either for subsetting or for analysis, how be it, uh, we want to think about this in some reasonable way. So given these different pieces of information, think about it, just will take two minutes, three minutes, talk to your neighbor. How would you go about, like what would you think of an example name should be for a file that would come out of this process? So what pieces of information should you include there? How would you include them? How would you order them? That kind of thing, okay? So we want to make sure we include type of assay, the plasmid used, row and column information, and CSV and the date.
So two or three minutes, so we'll go until 1145. Okay, so let's just come back together and just go through sort of, I'll talk about my thought process, about what I would do in this particular circumstance, and go through a couple alternatives as we do it, um, and basically see what we come up with at the end, and we can um, see if people have other ideas. Okay, so in this, basically, I'm just going to write in a text editor so you can follow along sort of what the thought process is of what are the key pieces of information that we would like to convey um, in the name of this particular file. So the first thing that we want to look at is the date in which this particular experiment occurred. Maybe the machine we later learned was down or had a calibration issue for a particular period of time. So date's going to be super fundamentally important. So we'll do in, again, that ISO format. Um, so 170704, and again, anytime you're dealing with something that's going to be a file name, realize that a lot of the time the ordering is going to be wonky unless you do sort of this um, zero padding on the left-hand side. So we know in this case months and days are only going to be sort of two characters wide, so that's not too bad. So that's definitely one piece of information we want to do. Um, I think something else that's important is the experiment type. So in this case, we're doing this BRAF um, assay of some kind. So that would be useful to include. Again, we might decide that just abbreviating it BRAF is sufficient, but if we're doing multiple experiments on the same gene, it's very possible to have multiple files then that have BRF in their name. So we want to specify what particular thing about BRF we're looking at. Um, the plasmid used is clearly important. So in this case, something like CL56, we want to keep that available to us. Um, we could do the culture, and in that case, say culture A, and then sample one. Um, we know also that this is going to be a CSV file, so we'll have a CSV suffix at the end. I don't think we need to bother with that right now. So those are the key pieces of information that we want to convey. The other thing that we want to think about, and I've already sort of given you an implicit hierarchy, is Again, the idea will be what's most important should be on the left and then sort of the sub-hierarchies as we move to the right. So what is everything sort of underneath? And here we could argue that it could be either date or experiment type. Do people have strong feelings about which way in which you would do that? What should be the beginning, the prefix of the file name? So I can definitely believe that. So basically saying let's start with BRFS assay as the beginning because the most important thing we're going to think logically or our brain is going to go to is, okay, I want to find something about BRAF. I'm going to then sort my files alphabetically and look for something that starts with B. That will bring me to the area I want. Um, for some people, they think a little bit more temporally and they want to think, okay, what was I doing a month ago about BRAF? In that case, maybe putting the date at the beginning would be better. But impl implicitly, you're going to be sorting by one and then by the other. So they're both certainly functional. They'll both work. Um, so what we want to do is we want to combine these things together and what we also want to do is to be careful of to make this machine readable because again I may want to go back in and be able to extract the date in some way using a regular expression or some other kind of text manipulation. So what I want to do is take each of these little bits of information that I have and separate them with a kind of standard character that I'm not using anywhere else. So in this case I think like an underscore would be a reasonable thing to use. Um, you are a little bit limited with file names. You can't use any character you want. Um, but finding something that works that you can then go in and say, take this string and split it anywhere that you see an underscore. Just so you can separate each logical idea from each other and then maybe create a data frame or something else from it later. So in that case, yeah, let's start with BRFSA assay, then I can put the date, then we can do, so in this case I may also want to put some context, not just CL56. So in this case I could say plasmid CL56. Again, this is something that doesn't necessarily help with the machine readability. It's easy to remove, but it then helps my brain figure out what's going on with the file. What am I referring to? That's not just some cryptic code there. Um, and then say, whoops, A1 for the particular well on that particular day, and then dot CSV. So again, the point here is that it's both machine readable. I can pull out any of those pieces I want. I can sort on any of those pieces that I want, as well as human readable. I can look at this file and right away know what it's about, when it happened, what were the particular important parameters of that experiment, and anything else that I want to know. Um, and say, if I wanted to say, okay, all of the 
A rows were contaminated, I can get rid of those files, or I can do whatever I want with them. So again, it's fairly simple ideas, but putting them all together and making it work is something that takes some thought at the beginning because it, a little bit of investment makes a huge payoff in the long run as the, co the project gets more and more complicated. Because you might start off with, and you might have five of these files. You could name them whatever you want, you could figure out what's going on, but when you start having hundreds or thousands of these, then you really need to be careful about what's going on to make sure you're getting what you, th you think and what's important. Um, I will also say, like, yes, your file system will give you things like file creation date and file modification date. Do not trust those. Those are very easy to screw up in some way or another accidentally and not realize what's going on. So those are helpful, but they're not something that's sort of set in stone. Using a date that's encoded in the actual name is much more reliable in the long run. Okay. So just an example of something that you might say, I guess, on top is an example of in the shell if you're interacting with things, so using the ls command with wildcards to match things that match plasmid, in this case that's all of them, or say in this case I want to find things that are scheme A. That will pull out just those particular ones, and again that's a good way of subsetting at the file level before you even bring everything into R, particularly if these are very large files, you don't want to read all of them, you only want the ones that are necessary at any given point. Um, and again, sort of another important example that people often overlook is that using the file name for metadata. So if I want this additional information to bring in, you could do something like this. So this is taking that file name, splitting it on those underscores, and then pulling those pieces apart and creating a data frame so I can then look up saying, okay, for that given file, what was the plasmid? What was the date? What was the well number? That kind of thing. So all of those are useful. Um, this is something that is from a particular paper in PLOS Computational Biology from 2009. And again, this is not sort of the fixed format that you need to use, but it's a suggested format for a computational biology project. And the basic idea is that you have one folder for your project and then you start to separate things and break them into different pieces. So in this case, they have, say, a data folder um, that contains different dates of, say, various experiments, and within it will be the actual data files. Um, that's another option as well that, say, you don't want to put the date in a particular file name, you can put the date in the folder and then the files in that. Um, again, you can misplace files and it gets problematic occasionally, but it is an option if the size is overwhelming. Um, we then have sort of a documentation folder, a source folder for scripts, binary, so in this case if you have compiled programs that you're using and you want to have them in that separate situation, um, and then results, or if you're having a paper, so in that case, your paper can pull from these other folders without having to rerun things or copy and paste stuff, that kind of thing. Um, definitely not all of these are important, are necessary, but I think something where you separate your code and your data a little bit so you don't just have one monolithic folder is a very, very good idea. So somebody can come in and right away say, okay, I'm interested in your data, I know where to go, I'm interested in your source code, I know where to go, that kind of thing is very important. Um, Generally speaking, so say for example the data we showed you earlier, like a proposed sort of file system that would work pretty well there is basically something where in this case we're making a explicit differentiation between the raw data, so the data you're getting from the outside source, and any other data files that we might modify. So we have a data raw and a data output. Um, so the data output would be where we would maybe write out the combined data frame of the three things together after we make our fixes. Um, the point of that is that you then save yourself the step of repeatedly doing that initial thing, and you can then later for scripts just read that in. Um, other things are like figure, R, tests, and then at the base level, something like a make file, which says, okay, here's how to run all the scripts to get to the final product that will produce the output that you're interested in. Um, and that can, again, in the case where you have a very large, slow running project, do each of the steps individually, check to make sure that one of them hasn't been updated so that you don't need to run a step. You can skip, skip the first one, so on. Um, and in this case, say like tests, that's where you could say have a separate directory of explicit tests like the one example we gave of checking that ages are not above 150. Um, and this is modeled in many ways off of the basic structure of what an R package looks like. That's a very good idea about how to sort of structure your stuff as well. Um, and here in this case, the manuscripts at the root level, that's fine. You can organize it how you want. Um, RMD files is not a big deal if you like using sweave um, and LaTeX. You tend to want a separate directory because LaTeX dumps out a bunch of intermediary files that are often sort of unsightly. It's again a matter of personal preference, your kind of thing, but having a consistent format and how you organize it is the more important thing. Um, this is just running through the things that I already just said, so I won't belabor the point and go through them, but again, 
at some core level, you want separation between your data and particularly the raw data that's sacrosanct, that needs to be special and be indicated as such. Um, and output and your R scripts is a very important thing to sort of keep things in an organizational way that makes sense and is workable. Um, particularly the data is what tends to blow up, a very, very large number of things, and so having that separate so you can find the scripts that you want becomes very useful. Okay, um, we're not gonna go into automation in a huge amount of detail because we've already talked about it a little bit. Um, the key point there is scripting is better than point and click. Basically, if you write a script, it's inherently self-documenting. It may not be the most obvious thing in the world. Reading code is hard, figuring out what it's doing, but it's still describing every single step of what's happening along the way. And that's really important. Um, there's better ways of doing things, so writing documentation, helping the user figure out what's happening is better, but anything where you can document the process is important, and scripting does do that. The code is self, inherently self-documenting, and that's an important thing. Things like Arc Markdown help you get that accomplished. So um, higher level automation also becomes important, so when you get a more complicated project that has lots of moving parts, lots of different R scripts that you might run. So the question earlier about saying, is it kosher to have a separate script file where you write a bunch of code and then use that within an R markdown? Absolutely. And at a certain scale, yes, you want to do that kind of thing because you don't want all of the code in one place, but you do want it clear what's happening at each step along the way. So having useful and descriptive function names make it clear to the user in the R markdown what's going on, but then they can look at all the details in an R script file later. So. This is an example of somebody writing some functions that sort of replicate the idea of a make file or the make utility in Unix. So the idea is that they sort of broke down each of the individual steps of what they need to do. So in this case, make ms is make the manuscript. So it's just a simple function that says, let's run rmark down the render function on the rmd and produce an HTML document from that. And then basically at the end, check does that file exist? If it doesn't, give me an error so I know that something went wrong with the R markdown as I went. Clean MS basically says, let's just clean up so I get back to an original pristine state. So no outputs, no intermediary things, and in this case, that just means delete the R, um, the manuscript.html, and make sure that that works. Um, make all would be sort of what's the process to get from nothing to a completed document. So in that case, make data does whatever we need to do to the data, make figures makes the figures, make tests run the tests, make manuscript, bring it all together, compile the document. Um, and so again, this is an example of what's called sort of just modularization. Taking each of the things you're doing, breaking it down into small manageable steps, and then organizing your document around that um, so that you can sort of see, okay, if there's a failure, it's not sort of online 1,322 in an RMD file, but this particular function in this particular file didn't run correctly. So you can go in and diagnose it and troubleshoot that kind of thing. Um, we mentioned briefly tests. Um, this is something that overlaps a lot with sort of our package development and how things have worked in that particular area. But tests are a very, very useful thing, again, just to make it explicit what your assumptions are about the data, what your assumptions are about the process of analyzing the data and everything else. Um, and so one of the really nice things is we showed you that you could include just a simple if-else statement in an RMD, or you could use this test that functionality. If you want to write lots of tests, test that has the functionality of grouping things together. So logically, if I'm testing a bunch of things about life expectancy, I can put all of those tests together and I can put them in a file called life expectancy underscore test.r. As you accumulate more and more of those, you may want to just run all the tests in one go. And so test that lets you basically say, here's a directory with a bunch of test scripts, run all of them and give me a report back at the end where it worked, where it failed. And so a large number of our packages will have this test directory that will test the functionality of that particular package, and part of the process of running, say, our command check is that it will go through and it will run all the tests and make sure everything passes, everything is working, and that's a good way of checking compatibility and everything else. It's good for our packages, it's good for your projects as well. Testing is a way of explicitly making sure what you're doing makes sense, the results make sense, all the assumptions are met, that kind of thing. And again, grouping them into a directory when they, again, start to get larger in size, when you have very many of them, becomes a much more reasonable thing to do as you go. And again, it's simple as a single function in R to run all of those tests and get a readable, understandable result back about where any problems might have been. So I'm going to pass over to Mina to talk a little bit about version control. So again, this is not one of our explicit listed of sort of four features of 
reproducibility, but is an incredibly important topic, so it, it deserves its own little bubble along that. Okay, if Colin hasn't solved you on, it's incredibly inter important. Maybe this will. And if you collaborate with people who get sloppy about naming their files in a way to indicate versions, you've probably been annoyed by this too. Um, so there are a variety of ways of doing version control, and I think the ultimate goal is indeed using a version control system that can be incredibly complicated but useful, and we'll get to that. But say you're not there for one reason or another, um, or maybe your collaborator is not there, there's still okay or good enough practices that you can use, and one of them goes back to file naming again. So uh, using dates um, and informatively named files can help incredibly with doing version control. So here, for example, we have both a date and also um, different stages of a paper, right? It's been submitted, it's been in uh, revision, it's published. So when you go back into that folder, you don't have to worry, okay, what is, which one was the final one here? Um, another thing that requires a lot of self-discipline, maybe you could automate it, but maybe if you're automating this, you know, enough to do other things anyway, is zipping the entire directory of your project files every time you make a change and save it with a date. Um, every time you make a change, it's probably a bit crazy, but maybe every time you make a significant change of some sort, however you want to define it, or share it with other collaborators as mileposts, that can be one way of versioning things. Um, or use a version control system. So we'll talk a little bit about using Git. Um, so why might you want to do that? It makes it a lot safer to experiment with code uh, because you can always track back and go back to an earlier point in time of your work. Um, it's pretty easy to set up and we're gonna actually do a brief demo of that night, right now. And it keeps a full history of your project. Um, that's especially helpful if you start going down a path and you're thinking, oh my, Turns out, now that I've gone down it and it's 4 a.m., I really should not have gone down it. So you can go back up to an earlier commit on your repository and branch back from there. Um, if you, since we have been highlighting using um, our studio to do some of the uh, things that we've kind of described as good practices for reproducibility. The fact that it integrates well with our studio also makes it a lot easier to get started with, or even if you're a pro user, to honestly keep things organized. Um, and using GitHub along with that, so Git is a version control system, right? GitHub is, allows you to get your um, project be on the web, either publicly or not, um, it backs up your project, so that's nice. It takes it off your hands to have to do that. There's really no setup to it. All you have to do is telling Git where to look in terms of the repo. Um, it has a large community, so chances are your colleagues are already there, and I think that's a good thing. Um, if you are sharing your work publicly on GitHub, I know one of the concerns um, I've certainly had, still from day to day have, um, my students often have, um, is the idea that, well, not anyone can see my code and critique my code and find out what I do wrong. But really think about it. When you have free time, are you going around GitHub looking at what people are doing wrong? Or are you actually only going and looking at those things when you think something might be useful for you and at other times, I don't know, going and having a beer with your friends? So chances are people aren't just around there just trying to go through every single um, commit you have to try to find something wrong. In fact, oftentimes if somebody is looking at your repository, any feedback that might give you will be useful. Um, and you'll learn from them as well. Um, it also has a really nice searchability feature. So one of the things I use GitHub a lot for is say I come across a new function and kind of don't feel like reading through the documentation, maybe the help file, or I have read it and still don't really have a good grasp of where how it's used in practice. So you can actually do that search and I find that very useful, even for looking back at my own work as to how did I use this theme before in my plot, for example. It has a good interface and tools to collaborate with others, which is nice, and then all your work lives in the same place. So what we're going to do is we're, I'm going to do a uh, demonstration of our studio's Git integration and I'm going to, integration, there's an extra R there for R, I guess. Um, 
I'm going to try to do this with potentially failing internet. So I, at some point, I might have to do the cooking show trick of, and now the ready one <laughs> from the oven for you. We'll see. Um, so let's go to Francois's repository, which I think is here. Oh, I hope it lets me at least go to a website. Do I now have it open? Huh. Yes. <laughs> See, it has let me go to a website. Um, OK. So you're welcome to follow along with me or not, if, um, and maybe not. OK. <laughs> um, if you have a GitHub account already, this probably looks familiar to you or if you've been on GitHub. So here is a project, which happens to be the project that contains all the source files for the presentation that we've been giving. Um, in the material folder, we have the RMD files that we have shared with you. And in the media file are just the pictures and whatnot that get used in the slides, OK? And we've been using an R presentation to build it. So there's just some um, auxiliary files associated with that and a readme and whatnot. Say you want to, you love this workshop and you want to give your own version at your own institution, so you're going to start with this. Um, one thing you could do is you could just um, download a version of this and then you have all the uh, files on your computer locally and work off of that. But if this is actually an ongoing project, right, so for perhaps for this workshop that could be fine. Um, but if this is an ongoing project where you want to keep your own uh, version and perhaps play with it and try enhancing it, but then be able to then come back and say, actually, what did Mina do in the last week? Might I want to integrate some of that work and pull back from that? Instead of um, making a static copy, um, forking the repository might be the way to go. So if you wanted to do that and maintain your own copy, you would click on the fork. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about once you have done that, Right? Once you have created your own copy, by the, either by locally down, uh, downloading the um, files or forking it, how can I now work with this in our studio so that we can demo the integration? Um, so, I'm, so on my own repository or a repository where I have access to push and pull from, um, I'm going to just copy the link over here. And I'm going to go to our studio, which is barking at me. And say so I want to open a new project. How many of you have used the project functionality in R Studio? That's great. I think it's a great way of maintaining like closed spaces, and then once you launch a project, that's your working directory. And just that to me is a selling feature of that not have to uh, point paths. Um, so I'm going to start a new project in from version control. So this is a Git project. Here is the URL that I had copied from the website. And here's the name of the project. I'm just going to put this on my desktop where, for the time being, where this can live. Now, once I hit Create Project, if there is enough Wi-Fi juice, this should actually clone the project locally for me. And what that will do is grab a copy of the files, but it's not just a download. It's also uh, maintaining the information for tracking things. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out of the oven the ready-made thing. So if it had cloned it, okay, um, it would look um, let me just find where I saved it really. It would look something like this. So it has a folder, and you can see that all of the files that were on GitHub are there as well. And what I like doing at this point is, again, I can interact with those files in any way I want. If you do use Git already and you have a different way of interacting with GitHub, say through a terminal, um, that's perfectly fine. But in this demo, I want to kind of highlight some of the things that makes your life a bit easier, especially if you're just getting started or you don't want to worry about um, just typing the comments. So I'm going to launch the R project. And I can see up here that that's the project that I'm working on. And over here, I have any of the files that have some changes um, that I have not pushed. I had made some changes over here. Um, I think this 
this was changed, at, uh, both of these were changed, I think, um, when Colin was kind of going through the demos, right? We haven't committed and pushed those, so that's why they're here. Um, let's change something else in another file. Let's say that this is the file, this is the second RMD document, and I wanna say blah, blah, blah. And as soon as I save that, you can see that that file shows up as a file with a pending change. I can quickly take a look at the diff, which is nicely um, colored. Something else I may have done is typed in my new nice words and gotten rid of some old stuff. So anything that's been removed is in red, anything that's been added is in green. So this is a nice visual way of seeing the changes you've made because remember, we want to document our work along the way. So if I want to, if I'm happy with this fix that I think blah, blah, blah is the right thing to be in this document, what I'd like to do is I'd like to stage this document. So that's adding it to, uh, for the change to be committed and um, typing up commit message, and seeing the diff visually is going to be very helpful. If I had made many changes to this document, and by the end when I'm done, I kind of forgot what are the things that I had changed, visually scanning it, making sure those are indeed the changes that I want, that's helpful, and then I type a um, a commit message, and then I commit that. And now I'm gonna commit this, I think. Um, so what, it's been, what happened is that change is now saved. So I no longer can see it as a staged um, change anymore. It has already been committed. So the next time I hit push, if there is enough internet juice, what's going to happen is that local change is going to be reflected in the repository. Then if I'm able to see that, uh, open that page up, I should be able to see that that commit has been um, push to it. So the idea here is that um, I think two things that I'll say um, that makes using uh, Git within our studio, uh, 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 this Git interface useful is one, especially if you're first getting started, it eliminates the need to learn the Git commands like Git add, Git push, Git pull, whatever. Um, and for the commands that you're going to use pretty much 95% of the time, um, you can just use this visual interface. Um, I'm sure some of us are command line purists and whenever you see a GUI, uh, you're like, nope, I don't need that. Um, and that's perfectly fine, but I think the visual diff, especially if you're working on a complicated project, is helpful. Um, I will say from my own experience that sometimes I get a bit git add happy and I'll just like do a bunch of changes and then say, yep, add it all, send it out. And then turns out, I mean, I have totally pushed like SSH keys to GitHub and stuff. And if you're telling me you've never done that, ask yourself a question. Ask yourself that question again when you're alone in a room. You've probably, if you have worked with Git or GitHub, you probably have pushed something you didn't intend to. It makes it a little less likely to do that if you're visually seeing what it is that you're pushing. So I think that's useful for that. Another thing is we've been talking about collaborating with others and potentially other domain scientists whose not everyday job is not to do data analysis. So perhaps they're not intending to learn how to use Git from a command line interface. But with something um, a little more lightweight like this, you might be able to get your collaborators to start using the tools that you like using as well. And I think that lowering the barrier to entry like that is uh, immensely helpful. Um, the other thing I will say is at a minimum, every time so you launch the project, as you can see, I had closed my project and relaunched it. Any changes that I've made that I hadn't uh, added and pushed are still there and visually seeing that is helpful as well. Any questions about, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so the question was um, if I have information here, some sort of perhaps files, I have passwords that would allow me to access a database, is that something I want to share in GitHub? My guess is no, it's not. So there are a few things that you can do. One of the um, things is each um, Git um, 
repository. Especially when you launch this in our studio, we'll, it will add a git ignore file, or this is something that you can add yourself manually. So any files that you don't want committed, so for example, if I had something in here called mypass.txt, I would add, add that here and add and push this change before, and then at that point, that file is not going to be tracked anymore. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I think this is our last section. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about dissemination, so sharing, publishing, and archiving your work. So why might you want to share and archive your data and code? It is possible that it is a funding agency or a journal requirement. Um, I this is increasingly starting to be a thing, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so, uh, because it's when the person who says, no, I will withhold funds from you, is when people actually start doing things. Um, so it might be that you might have to do that. And if you're told that you have to do that, you want to think about what's the right environment, what's the toolkit for, for your project for that. Your community expects it. At this point, um, especially as users of an open source language, my guess is if when you come across something that you think is cool and then you can't find any information about it publicly, that's frustrating. Um, so especially, this could be just an R thing or it could be something in your scientific domain that's expected from you. Additionally, it does get you increased visibility and citation. So I talked about potentially worrying about putting your out there as a negative thing, but to be honest, chances are you're going to benefit from it than not. So here's an um, article from 2013 called Data Reuse and the Open Data Citation Advantage, and here's one of the figures from that. Uh, the different um, facets here are the years that the paper was published in, um, the yellow stands for the number, that's the, um, uh, for uh, citations for data not available, and the blue is the citations for data is available, and you can see that in each one of these, we're seeing that um, the blue is a bit shifted uh, more positively. So if you do have your data available, more people are likely to cite and share your work. Um, Another reason is better research, and yes, I think we can all agree, chances are you've take, decided to take your morning to come hear about reproducible science, so you believe this is good practice. But um, looking at this a bit more empirically, here's a paper from 2011 where uh, the researchers actually looked at um, reporting errors in the papers. So here we have data not shared in the first column and data shared in the second column. The darker the slice, the more errors there are in the um, paper. So first one's looking at all errors or um, large reporting errors, so to the second decimal, um, or reporting errors concerned with a p-value of less than 0.05. And we can see that in each of these cases, if the data were shared, there's less likely to be reporting errors. Now, I think there are potentially some confounders here. It might be that the researchers who are in the mindset of sharing their data are otherwise a bit more organized. 
Um, and I think that's a good thing. It is also possible perhaps they're more experienced. Um, and if that's the thing that's um, explaining this, that doesn't necessarily speak to why uh, you want to do your work reproducibly there, the takeaway lesson would be get more experience. But I would, um, I would hypothesize that chances are there's an element of organization that comes with getting your work ready to be shared that also comes with a reduction in reporting errors. For example, if you are generating your paper in R Markdown and you know, midway through your project you realize, no, these three records need to go. There was something about them that was wrong and you take them out, um, now it falls on you to regenerate all of the figures. And if that's happening automatically at the push of a button, there won't be reporting errors. If it falls on you as a human to go through one by one and redo things, it is likely that there will be an error. If you have to ask another person to do that for you and then you're going to check their work, it's likely there will be even more errors. Um, so where can you archive or publish? There might be domain specific data depositor uh, repositories for the domain you're working in. Um, the source code hosting services like GitHub or Bitbucket are good places. There are some limitations on the size of data you can push there though. Um, there are generic repositories that you can use like Dryad, Fig Figshare, or Zenodo. Your institution might have a repository. Or journal supplementary materials is another one. But I'm going to gray that one out as I don't think that that's necessarily a best practice here because they are not maintained in some way, right? So that sits there as a static thing and it's possible that that's going to go away or be limited access. Um, so I think that if you are thinking of archiving and publishing your data, I try to stay in one of the first four. Um, Especially if you're in an academic institution, but even if not, um, chances are there's a data management guide for the type of work that you do. So it's important to familiarize yourself with that. Um, and it's not just a set of rules. Chances are there's also humans who have put this together who are willing to work with you to get your data to a place to um, make it better managed and ready to be shared. Um, so do connect with those people in your institutions and ask for their help. How to share and publish. Some do's, non-proprietary non uh, file formats, text files we talked about being good. Don't put your data in PDFs um, or Word documents. <laughs> um, Excel is a place where a lot of people save data, but again, if it's a .xls file, that's a proprietary format. If you're able to save it as a plain text thing, an Excel user can still open it, but a non-Excel user can as well. So think about um, who is going to be accessing it. I think um, something that I see a lot, especially with um, researchers who are in um, academic institutions, but maybe elsewhere as well, is the thought of, oh, I have a site license for it, so it's fine, like we get Excel for free at Duke, okay, but you're not always going to be collaborating with people from that same institution. So think about wider use than just the people at your institution. Um, and lastly, let's talk a little bit about licensing. Uh, so there are a variety of licenses that you can use. I think this uh, little figure is a good one to kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, so the, the question was, what do I think about publishing HTML files, like the output of the markdown? So I think for viewing purposes, that's fine. Um, but I would say that's only for viewing purposes. Um, getting the information out of that to get back to your analysis, I'm sure is doable, but like it's probably a very difficult thing to do that programmatically versus if you're sharing your R markdown file, Anybody with R can rerun and generate those. Um, another thing to keep in mind is it is possible for your R Markdown document to kind of be out of sync that with your HTML. So if I cha make a change in my R Markdown file but I don't knit it, that will not be reflected in the HTML file. So I'll mention that um, 
when I, I, I personally actually don't commit my HTML files to my repositories, perhaps until the very end if it's going to be needed for sharing. So here, I finally today did commit the HTML file of the presentation because that's what we need to be able to render it. And that, by the way, is the reason why you don't have the slides because then I couldn't push it because the internet, <laughs> it's just like, too big. But um, in my class, for example, our, my students are not allowed to have HTML files in their repositories because they tend to get out of sync. So I think I would say use that as a way to view your work, but not much more than that. Did you have something to add? Long-term data archiving. So I am guessing you're asking for something longer term than one something these can handle. Sorry. I see. Um, I'm not sure if I can think of something that would. So, so I would think in terms of longer term. I'm trying to think why some of these would fail on that end. Um, no, I, I personally have not actually, but that's a good question. So GitHub would be a good long-term solution, but it does not deal with a uh, large file. So what if you have a large file that you can't commit to GitHub, but you need it to be maintained. So um, if institutional repository is something that is an option for you, my guess is there, there would be, um, there would not be limitations as long as you can make your case for it. Um, I think that Figshare might be another good option for you. I'm actually, off the top of my head, I don't know the file size limit there, but I think that um, you're able to have larger files that go with um, your project there. Okay. What did you say it is? Internet Archive dot gov. So that are others familiar with another option for open source project that could handle long-term and large file storage? Can you uh, repeat? Go, go, BigQuery. So that, that, that might be a solution. Any other questions? Okay. So I will move on to licensing. All right. So um, if it is recommended that when you put your work out there, your data out there especially, that. Uh, Sorry, actually, not your data, right? Um, your work out there um, that you use, a license that will be informative for um, others to very quickly be able to understand what they can do with it. Do you want it to be permissive? Um, as in, they can take your work and then use it for something proprietary? Or do you want it to be something like copyleft, where if I've shared my work openly, 
I would like it to remain that way and only be used for open source project and say nothing for commercial uses. These are all decisions that you're going to need to make yourself. Um, my guess is there might be standards that are used by um, many of the people in the specific domain or community that you work in and it's usually good practice to try to stick with that if that's feasible for you. Um, a lot of the time, um, one thought is if I'm releasing my work openly, then I'd like anyone, any derivative of it to be used in that way as well. But you might want to think about could that then potentially be used in corporate training or not, for example. Uh, and if the answer is no, but you would like it to be able to be used, then you may want to change that license. So it's a good thought process um, before you start your work. But don't put a license on facts, <laughs> which is your data. Uh, that's a whole other thing. Um, also think about licenses versus community norms. A lot of us um, put products out there that are open source, um, and perhaps they have a public domain license, as in, no, you don't have to cite it. But what is the community norm? The fact that you don't have to, or that you can take it and do anything you want with it, that still doesn't preclude you from saying thank you so much to the people who have put in the work to put this product together. So think about what the community norms are in the um, domain that you work in and be nice. <laughs> um, this is, I think, a good read from 2011, Reproducible Research in Com uh, Computational Science. And the idea was to think about this um, continuum of good, better, and best. So if you have some work out there that's just the publication, so you have this one PDF paper that has been accepted, published, great, but there's nothing else that goes with it. That's not at all reproducible. Now on the other end is a fully reproducible project where somebody could download or go to your whole repo, rerun your entire analysis, and literally maybe using the structure that Colin mentioned with make files, generate that PDF that is your paper. Or your work might be somewhere in between. One of the questions that came up during the break was, um, what if my data can't be shared because it's proprietary? Well, then think about can your code be shared? Does your data come in a format that people in your domain are pretty familiar with? You simply cannot share that, but you can share your code or the methodology that you um, devised and let others reuse that. So you might be somewhere in the continuum over here and just because your data is private doesn't box you into that blue box over there and I think that's important to think about. Um, another thing that I often here um, is some, the, um, some portion of people who tend to work with private data uh, kind of equate this idea of reproducibility with open science completely. And while these things too tend to go hand in hand because people who care about one tend to care about the other as well, they're not of the same. So the fact that you can't have your work publicly available on GitHub with all of your data files does not mean you shouldn't be version tracking for yourself. So you might just be locally uh, using Git, not putting anything on GitHub. All of the best practices that we talked about still apply. So do not stop listening <laughs> just because your data is private. There's a lot that you can do even if you're only going to share it with yourself and a couple of your lab mates. Um, in general, forming reproducible habits really pay off. Um, they can, reproducible practices can be applied after the fact, but it is much harder. The last thing you want to do once you're done with a project is go back and document stuff. So do it as you go along. It'll be better because your thoughts will be fresh and it won't feel like extra work, especially because of what we talked about, this idea that it's not necessarily the thing that tends to get you credit for, especially in certain settings like academia, so doing it after the fact is probably a no-go anyway. And now you're doing this for others rather than your own benefits. Doing it after the fact seems like it's to share with others and that's always harder. Um, and if you try to do that, chances are you're never going to get to the publication point. 
Um, adopting pr practices for rep reproducible science from the outset pays off in multiple ways too. It's easy and little work while the project is still small and contains a few files. And now all you're uh, doing is reproducible. There's no painful consideration when it comes to sharing stuff. And your future self is going to be happy. Um, one thing that I like doing is um, I, I work with researchers who have certain habits who want to adopt better ones. And then I also work, I'm lucky enough to work with a group of people who are completely brand new students who have no other habits. And let me tell you, the latter group is a lot easier to work with because they don't have a paradigm that they are trying to break out of. That's what they're learning anyway. Um, so try to box yourself into that. When you're starting something new, try to start on that and try to uh, adopt the best practices from that point onwards. Um, some R packages that might help you. Roxygen is great for documenting your functions. Bookdown is a package that provides supports for cross-referencing and citations, and you don't have to be writing a book at the end of the day. Um, project template is a useful um, tool for automating project setup, so you can run the package and it'll create all the folder structures for you that Colin was mentioning. Um, for automation, we talked about Make, which is a Unix tool. Um, but if your expertise is with an R and you're not learning, looking to learn another uh, language or tool, Remake is a package that uh, attempts to have the make functionality just have it live in R. It's not on CRAN, but it's a great package to build robust reproducible analyses with. Um, and in terms of dissemination, I mentioned Figshare as a service. Uh, you can directly upload your um, data sets to Figshare from R using the R Figshare package. And I'd like to acknowledge um, those who have supported the work of the Reproducible Research Hackathon and the data carpentry workshops from which um, these were drawn from. And lastly, um, everything that, was, that we showed here uh, at this workshop is actually generated fully reproducibly. So if you go to the GitHub repository, um, you will see that the presentation and all the other files are there and you can generate it for yourself. Um, the, the HTML file with the presentation is also there, so if you do uh, get a copy of the repo, you'll be able to generate the slides. And soon as I am elsewhere wh where I can push the final version of the slides, I'll tweet out a link to that if you would like to get back to them. Um, I think we have a few resources at the end, so I'll leave these here. Are there any questions that we can answer? Or any comments? Yeah. So the question was about as your projects get large and you have these source files that you're running through, it is possible that they're generating variables that are named the same throughout and hence once you run script B after running script A, some of your variables get overwritten. Do you have something to say about it? Is that working? Okay. That's one of those things where how you run the scripts matter. So oftentimes if you're using a tool like make, the way that that works is you're saying, you're basically giving a command line command to do something. So you'd say our script and that, that avoids that issue because each of those files is then being run in its own session. So they do not share an environment, they don't overlap in any way, that solves that problem. There's other hacky things you can do at the beginning. So you can do like RM and LS the entire environment, and delete it and hope that, that clears it up. So each script could start with that at the beginning. I don't think there's one universal solution to how to do that, but it's one of those things that often you just need to bake into whatever sort of automation process you're using to go back and rerun all of those scripts together. It sounds mostly though, it's just the fact that if you do them all within one session and source each of them, they're sharing their environment and they sort of cross-contaminate. It's a very common problem. That's one of the reasons like taking the step out of R to do that automation step often helps. I'm not sure if Remake 
handles that. I wouldn't be surprised if they do do something like that. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question was in terms of uh, funding research with public money, should they be following these best practices and if so, what do we do to um, reinforce that, right? For asking for my personal opinion, my answer would be yes, absolutely. Um, if this is where better science is, and I believe it is, then it, it definitely should be. We've shared some, um, you know, a couple of studies from earlier in terms of what happens when reproducibility fails, um, and I think that it, in my opinion, it's not just research with public money. Any research should be following these steps. What do we do to reinforce this? I mean, if it becomes indeed uh, part of the funding requirement, so that was one of the things that we mentioned earlier, right? If that's a funding agency or a journal requirement, and I think that that first bullet point, there's like a arrows that go in circles there. As journals require it more, they're more likely that the funding agencies will so on and so forth. Um, how do we make this happen? I think those of us who are um, active in the open science community uh, need to make our voices heard. But I have to say that as somebody who also has a home in an academic environment, I don't think, I think it's very, very difficult to make that fully happen if also academic institutions are not going to bake that into um, incentive structure for their researchers because it is really tough to be a junior researcher trying to get through the academic system if some of your efforts are considered a waste of time. <laughs> because they don't directly contribute to an additional publication, but contribute to making an existing uh, publication better, for example. So I think there is a third thing, funding agency journal requirement, but also academic institutions is a third um, point there that needs to kind of get with the program here. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. So the question is, and that's a really good question. So we had this folder structure earlier where you can basically run a make command and like get to your final paper, for example, right? But that paper likely does not have a lot of the steps that you've done. I mean, to be honest, maybe a majority of your work doesn't end up there. It's initial exploratory steps um, that result in figures that don't end up in the paper. Where do they go? Um, I think a good place to put them would be a separate fold. So if you are indeed generating the, your final work uh, within one folder automatically, that would be a separate folder where those live, but perhaps don't get rerun to generate the final paper, but have a record that's well documented, commented, dated of your thought process. And I would think that some of the decisions you're making in your final work refer back to some of the things that you've seen there. So I can see a lot of need for cross-referencing saying, we're removing this record due to what we've found during the exploratory stage, maybe even link to whatever script is revealed, uh, that particular attribute in your data. So I literally gone through something like that on a project last week. Um, I'm not sure this is the best practice. What I tend to end up doing is, yes, basically you're creating subfolders within your R scripts. So here's my original sequence. I decide that I don't need steps three and four. I move all of those out. And it's basically a refactoring exercise. I think this is one of the places, though, where using version control becomes very useful because you're a lot more free and willing to say, I don't think I need this, so I'm just going to delete it and remove it. Um, because if I needed it, I can go back to that version history, I can recover it, I can look things up, it's always there. 
it depends on really if you think somebody else might be using that later, then yes, you want to keep it around. If it's really just that, that told me that this avenue doesn't work, but this one does, and I can get rid of it now, then feel free. It's all in the version control. It's all in the history. You can get it back at any point. Thank you. And it's something too, again, we, we mentioned lots of issues, like if you go back to the very beginning about software things. Notice we haven't talked about software dependencies at all. That's a really important thing. As you write scripts, there's implicit dependencies in terms of what libraries you load and everything else. R has dealt with that for a long time. It's in the package thing. It's baked into the description files. So in that case, it makes it explicit. You have to figure out what those are, put them in, make sure everything is there. You can put version dependencies, that kind of stuff. So yes, building packages out of this stuff, it's a much more onerous thing to do, but it, it is very much in the spirit of this kind of reproducible research thing. It's very useful kind of thing to do. We just need to convince more people to do it. Any other questions or comments? All right, so I guess we'll end a little bit early, but thank you so much. I hope you got something useful out of this. And um, as I said, the materials for this and the materials that fed into this from the two-day workshop are all openly available. So use it for your own learning, or if you are teaching others, p please feel free to grab them. All right, thanks. <laughs>